morning, everyone, and welcome to Emission Reduction Alberta's latest Lessons Learned Workshop and Spark Speaker Series event. I'm Steve McDonald, the CEO of ERA. Thank you all for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedules to hear insights from a series of ERA-funded projects in Alberta's agriculture, agri-food, and forestry sectors. We hosted our first Lessons Learned Workshop in 2018 and have since covered topics including utility scale solar, carbon capture, utilization and storage, and oil sands extraction innovations. Our panelists today will share the challenges they faced, the barriers they overcame, and their real world implementation experiences from ideation to project demonstration. Today, we have nearly 300 audience members registered to learn with us. And it's wonderful to see this level of interest. I'd also like to thank Robert Syke for being here to deliver our Spark Speakers Series keynote. This series features thought leaders from a variety of industries to share their insights, ideas, and experiences. We'll be hearing from him at approximately 1025. Thank you again, Rob, for being here today. For more than 10 years, ERA has been investing the revenues from the carbon price paid by large emitters to accelerate the development and adoption of innovative clean technologies. Sharing outcomes from these projects through events like this is a critical part of our work. To truly accelerate innovation, we must capture and share the new knowledge being created. This allows us to build on past successes and to avoid making the same mistakes over and over. But, but before we dive into our session, we thought a funding announcement would be the perfect way to start the day. To make this announcement, I am very pleased to introduce the Honorable Jason Nixon, Alberta's Minister of Environment and Parks. We had a hand. Thank you, Steve. It's always a pleasure to join Emissions Reduction Alberta and industry members, innovators, and investors to celebrate great projects happening right here in our province. And today is no exception. I have to start by saying that the ERA does an impressive job hosting these workshops and webinars. These events are a fantastic opportunity to talk about solutions and challenges and how we can work together to position Alberta for success through innovation and technology. I know a key part of these discussions is the importance of provincial funding. Alberta's government is committed to helping sectors of all sizes and types reduce emissions, create jobs, and stay competitive. Funding from our tier program is doing just that. And ERA's food, farming, and forestry challenge is a prime example. Alberta's government has made tier funding available through ERA for this challenge, which supports low carbon or reduced emissions in Alberta's important agriculture, agri-food, and forestry sectors. Today, I'm pleased to share that 33 million from TIER is supporting 17 projects that are worth 107 million in public and private investment. Projects are located across the province in areas like Edmonton, High River, and Lethbridge. Of the 17 projects, there are four natural solution projects, seven bio industry and bioenergy sector projects, and six projects in the agriculture and agri food sectors. A number of exciting innovative technologies are being funded. A few I would like to highlight include using drones to help reforest remote rural environments, using feed additives to cut emissions from cattle by up to 90%, and using artificial intelligence for more efficient energy use at pulp mills. If all the projects are successful, they will reduce about 2.7 million tons of emissions by 2030. The food farming and forestry challenge is another step Alberta is taking to balance the needs of the environment and the economy. The projects coming out of this challenge will attract local and international investment open up new markets, and assure long-term growth and success of these sectors. Funding will help our valued farmers, ranchers, and industry cut emissions, improve resource efficiency, and grow production. These sectors play an important role in Alberta's economy. In 2019, the agriculture and forestry sector employed nearly 100,000 Albertans, and our agri-food exports reached a record of 11.6 billion, led by beef, wheat, and canola. In 2019, Alberta produced 32% of Canada's wheat, about 29% of Canada's canola, and almost half of Canada's barley, and more than 40% of Canada's total cattle inventory. In fact, we have more cattle than people, 
with an estimated 4.5 million cows as of 2020. In 2019, Alberta also emitted more than 32 million tons from agriculture, agri-food, and forestry operations combined. That's more than 34% of Canada's total emissions from these sectors. There's a clear opportunity here to cut emissions and lower costs for producing and processing food and fiber, and to leverage nature-based solutions that capture and store carbon. This funding will aid in economic recovery at a time when it's needed most, while acting as a catalyst for overcoming barriers and building a strong future for Alberta's biological industries. Congratulations to the successful technologists receiving funding from this food, farming, and forestry challenge. Your 17 projects were selected out of 150 applications, requesting a total of $383 million for projects worth $1.5 billion, and that is certainly something to celebrate. I know these technologies range in their stages of development, and I look forward to seeing each and every one of them take shape. Thank you to all who applied for this funding, and to everyone taking part in today's workshop. We are very fortunate to have so many world-class leaders thinking, acting, and investing for the future right here in Alberta. Enjoy the workshop. Thank you again for having me today. Thank you, Minister Nixon, for your support and for sharing this exciting news. It is your support of the partnership between government, innovators, and industry that helps drive the innovation Alberta needs to create the future we want. And as you pointed out, the innovation capacity of Alberta's food, farming, and forestry sector is world-class, and they are critical to achieving Alberta's economic and environmental goals. I am pleased to now share a series of slides that provides details on the 17 recipients selected through our highly competitive and rigorous process. As Minister Nixon said, if successful, these projects will lead to cumulative GHG reductions of up to 2.7 million tons of CO2 by 2030. This is the equivalent of removing the annual emissions from over 800,000 cars, or the equal to the amount of carbon sequestered over by over 3.3 million acres of forest in one year. Flash forest, your drones are going to be very busy. With this announcement, we have now committed $646 million toward 204 projects worth over $4.3 billion. Our to total portfolio of projects is estimated to deliver cumulative GHG reductions of nearly 38 million tons by 2030. This will also help to improve the competitiveness of our existing industries and create new business opportunities throughout Alberta. And I encourage everyone to visit our website at eralberta.ca to learn more. At ERA, we have many ways of sharing stories about our funded projects, including our Carbon Copy podcast. You must listen to it. And if you do listen to it, you might recognize the voice of Karen from Baresco, who is one of our panelists today. We also tell our stories through videos. In a moment, we'll share our latest story focused on food farming and forestry challenge winner, Horseshoe Power. They are working with Doff Greenhouse in Lacoma County to construct a 13 acre 
hydroponic vegetable greenhouse that will use waste heat and CO2 from co-located natural gas field, a co-located natural gas field and power plant. After the video, I'll hand things over to ERA's chief smart guy and, our, and your moderator for our lessons learned workshop, Dr. Mark Summers. Thank you to all our speakers and everyone listening in today. I hope you find the conversation to be informative and inspirational. Full of gas wells around here already. We acquired some more. We brought them all together, reconfigured all the pipe, brought the natural gas into this site and did the full on. We call it tri-generation because we actually make electricity, heat and carbon dioxide for the greenhouse here and electricity to the grid. My name is Brad Murray. I'm president of Horseshoe Power. Horseshoe Power and Doof's Greenhouse are collaborating on a tri-generation project to turn waste heat and CO2 from natural gas production into a valuable local resource for the greenhouse. With traditional cogeneration, you burn natural gas to turn a generator to produce energy. In doing so, you create heat, which you can also capture and use. For this project, Doof's isn't just using horseshoe energy's leftover heat to heat their greenhouses. They're also using the CO2 that's produced to feed their crops. That natural gas is generating three different usable things. Power, heat, and CO2. Hence, tri-generation. My name is Eric Doof. I'm a managing partner with Doof's Greenhouses Limited in Lacombe, Alberta. So we have a variety of crops uh, under glass and plastic. We grow peppers, uh, long and short cucumbers, uh, eggplant, and some lettuce. We're standing here in phase one of our new greenhouse expansion, and this is all bell peppers. Probably around four years ago, we met with Brad and one of his partners. They owned the gas wells locally, so we had access to local gas. And at the time, for us to get more gas for future expansions would cost a lot to add extra in infrastructure and piping through the traditional gas grid. So the nice thing about back then as well is we didn't have to really think about managing and owning and operating the, the facility. We could focus on our, our greenhouse. With funding from ERA's Food, Farming and Forestry Challenge, Horseshoe Power and Doof's Greenhouse are embarking on four major projects. First, they're reclaiming heat and CO2 from Horseshoe's generators. Excess heat is used to heat the greenhouse, while the exhaust produced is cleaned and cooled into a CO2 supplement for plants. Second, they're using water distillation technology from ships to treat wastewater from Horseshoe Power's wells creating pure water that Doof's can use to irrigate crops. Third, Doof's relies on natural light, which is tough during long Alberta winters. So, they're installing broad spectrum LED lights to grow pepper crops in a two acre trial. The lights are more efficient with less emissions. And last, to detect premature mold that can result in returns and more waste and emissions, Doof's is installing a laser detection system to catch mold before the local produce ever gets shipped and we look at them as they're all enablers. There's a lot of stuff going on that we're, we're advancing in this greenhouse, in the energy center, in, in the gas gathering and gas treatment systems. It's not, it's not one silver bullet. It's, it's all these little things that are coming together to make us more efficient, less emissions, and more profitable altogether. ERA grant is $2 million, and our overall project's about four and a half million. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Minister Nixon, for sharing that exciting funding announcement. Seeing projects related to remediating linear disturbances, reducing methane emissions in cattle, and innovation across the agriculture, agri-food, forestry, and forest products industries is a perfect way to kickstart today's event. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Summers. I'm the Executive Director of Technology and Innovation for ERA and I have the distinct pleasure of being the moderator for today's event. Thank you once again for joining our latest Lessons Learned Workshop and Spark Speaker Series event. We have a great program lined up for you today while the agenda loads up. We have already crossed off two items from our list, the welcoming remarks from our own Steve McDonald and that important funding announcement from Minister Nixon. 
We are very fortunate today to be joined by three experts representing three different ERA funded projects. I'll introduce each of them in a minute. And after we hear from these three presenters, we'll have a moderated panel discussion and we'll be taking questions from the audience. We're also fortunate to have author, entrepreneur and thought leader Rob Syke as our Spark series keynote presenter today. We also have time set aside for a Q&A with Rob. It's gonna be a lively discussion and I look forward to it. Now, before we welcome our panelists, I have a couple quick housekeeping items I just wanna go through. First of all, we're expecting a few hundred participants today. So everyone's microphone is muted to avoid unintentional background noise. Now, if you encounter technical challenges related to the webinar connection, please feel free to email my colleague, Kevin at kduncan at eralberta.ca and he'll try to help out if he's able to. Now, if you can't resolve your technical issues or if you need to leave early, we will be posting a recording of today's event on our website at eralberta.ca in the next few days. Uh, that'll include both the video and the audio as well as the slides. So even though we won't field any questions until the Q&A portions of the agenda, you are most welcome to type your questions at any time while our panelists are presenting uh, by entering them through the Q&A panel on this platform. If you move your mouse around, you should see a toolbar appear with a tab that says Q&A. It's usually somewhere near the bottom middle. Uh, click that and enter your question there. Now, I would say if your question is directed at a particular panelist, please indicate in your question who the question is intended for when you type it out. Uh, we have a lot of people online today, um, uh, up about almost 200 right now and a few more expected to join in throughout the course of the event. Uh, so we expect a lot of really great questions. Now, the other thing I should note is if you see a question in the Q&A box from another attendee that you like, please vote for it by hitting the thumbs up next to that question. So what, what that'll do is it'll help us to ensure we're addressing the most relevant questions. And when we look through the list of questions, we will be looking at those that receive the most votes. Primarily, we'll scan through the list, but we'll, we're probably going to take a look at the list of those that receive the most votes, at least to start with. All right, with that understood, let's meet our panelists. Today, I am very pleased to welcome three distinguished panelists, Dr. Maria Strack, Karen hogan Kazira, and Dr. John Basarb. Welcome, Maria, Karen, and John. We are pleased you could join us, and we are all looking forward to today's discussion. Our presenters will have 10 minutes each to give us an overview of the projects they've completed what the outcomes and learnings were from those projects, and ultimately what the impacts of these innovations could be for both greenhouse gas emissions and the economy in the province of Alberta. So without further ado, I am pleased to first welcome Dr. Maria Strack. Maria is a professor and the Canada Research Chair for Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo. Thank you so much for joining us today, Maria. Whenever you're ready, uh, please turn on your video, share your screen, and feel free to take it away. Okay, we're getting going here, I hope. <laughs> okay. I think you should be able to see the screen now. Yep, looking good. Perfect. Uh, so thanks so much, and it's my pleasure to be here today to talk about um, our previously ERA-funded uh, project, and congratulations to all the newly uh, funded projects that we saw today. Um, just before I start, I do want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the University of Waterloo, and Waterloo is located on the Haldeman Track, which includes land promised to the Six Nations, extending 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River, representing the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. And what I'm going to talk to you today is about a project that we did looking at mitigating greenhouse gas emissions from peatlands. But I also wanted to start with um, talking a bit about why peatlands are so important when we think about climate change and emission uh, reductions. And that's because boreal peatlands are carbon storage superstars. And in Canada, uh, we're 
very blessed by having an abundance of these ecosystems. So they represent 12% of our land area or 113 million hectares. They're this really dense carbon store. And in Alberta, we're even um, more blessed. You can see some of these uh, darkest gray areas with the greatest area of peatlands in Northern Alberta. And in Alberta, they do cover 16% of the land base. And this represents an enormous stock of carbon. About 150 to 160 gigatons of carbon are estimated to be stored in Canadian peatlands. And that's an amount equivalent to over 750 years of our current rate of greenhouse gas emissions. So unfortunately though, uh, we know that disturbance can result in greenhouse gas emissions from these ecosystems. And so peatlands are really good greenhouse gas sinks in an undisturbed state because they have a net uptake of carbon dioxide. And so the plants in, the, in peatlands photosynthesize and as they die and, and are deposited in these peatland ecosystems, the saturated soil conditions create anoxic soils which lead to really slow rates of decomposition. And so this organic material builds up over time. But these anoxic conditions also allow for the production of another greenhouse gas, methane. And so when we think about the radiative forcing that a peatland will have, we have to understand both the uptake of the carbon dioxide and the emissions of methane. And when we do this for natural peatlands, we know that over the time that they've been developing and because they're these persistent long-term sources of CO2, that they have had a net cooling effect on the climate over time. But any type of disturbance on the landscape could turn these greenhouse gas sinks into greenhouse gas sources. And that's because the rates of these greenhouse gas exchanges are driven by conditions like the plant community, the water table and the temperature. So any disturbance that alters those things could change the greenhouse gas balance. And we know this fairly well for things like drainage and uh, agriculture, for example. But in Alberta, we know we have a lot of other disturbances on the land base, like in the image on the left where we can see um, an exploration or, uh, oil pad or uh, seismic lines and, and pipelines. And we don't know well what those might do, but we think that they, should, they would also cause um, greenhouse gas emissions that we then have the opportunity to reduce. And so that's where our project came in. We wanted to mitigate land use greenhouse gas emissions in these peatlands to be, really harness that as a natural climate solution. And our project was entitled Improved Construction of Roads and Pipelines to Minimize Impact on Peatland Greenhouse Gas Emissions. Now, the problem was that we, we knew from some of the hydrologic and vegetation changes that we saw adjacent to roads that cross peatlands that we would expect that greenhouse gas emissions were being induced but no one had actually quantified that before. And so our first objective was simply to determine what the impact of current roads were on greenhouse gas emissions. And then once we knew that, we could evaluate the potential to reduce those emissions by thinking about innovative low impact construction methods. And we did this using a multi-scale approach where we collected the on the ground field data that we needed to quantify those greenhouse gas emissions, but we also wanted to develop geospatial tools that we could then use at larger scales so that we could assess those fluxes that were induced as well as the mitigation potential at ecosystem to watershed scales. And so this is one spot where I want to talk about some of the challenges that we faced. And, and the first was that this is not a technology in a traditional sense. And I see there's, there's lots of great natural climate solution projects now that have, have been funded, but at the time this led to some difficulty with us sort of just getting the right, the vocabulary right as we were, as we were thinking about this project. And what we were really aiming at then were best management practices that would lead to these land base emission reductions. We also were there and we were funded in order to determine the potential for these greenhouse gas emission reductions, but we had to rely on our partners to implement the low impact road construction. And at the time we were funded, the price of oil was very high and in situ sites were being built very rapidly. So we thought there would be no problem to have a new section of road built. But by the time we actually undertook the project, the price of oil had declined. There really wasn't any new construction going on at a lot of in situ sites. And we had to pivot then slightly um, instead of constructing a new section of road to actually compare sections um, where there were no culverts to where there were cul culverts so that we could just assess what, how effective culverts might be in mitigating these greenhouse gas emissions. And just before I present some of our results, I do want to acknowledge that our study was uh, took place 
just outside Peace River, uh, which is Treaty 8 territory and the traditional lands of the Woodland Cree First Nation. And so this is largely the work of my former PhD student, Sarah Swati. And what she found then was that as we expected, but you know, now we have some numbers to quantify it, was that road crossings did increase greenhouse gas emissions in the adjacent peatland areas. And if you've done any driving around the province, you've probably seen how these roads can act as dams when they cross wetland areas. And this leads to flooding on the upstream side, as you can see in this one study site, um, and then often drying on the downstream side. And so that hydrologic impact overall increased methane emissions in the road affected area. But we also found that carbon dioxide uptake was, was reduced. So the sites were, were able to act as, as less of a sink. And this had to do with those hydrologic changes, but also had more to do with the vegetation clearing, which we often see adjacent to roads. And this is partially uh, occurs during construction, but is actually more widespread because utilities often run alongside roads or for line of sight. And so when we looked, when we investigated mitigation potential, what we found was that the culverts could mitigate that hydrologic impact, but it didn't necessarily mitigate the greenhouse gas emissions because we still had the clearing of that vegetation and the hydrologic impact varies between sites and culverts can, are, are effective more or less depending on the local conditions. What we did find though, was that we could use drones to map things like biomass, water table and surface elevation in our peatlands and this could then um, upscale our greenhouse gas emissions so we could apply them to estimate greenhouse gas um, fluxes and mitigation potential at larger scales. And this is where one of our opportunities arose. Um, as we were there and, and collecting imagery to understand the road impacts, we actually collected a lot of data on other disturbances on the landscape. So the photo on the left here is it, a map of elevations that was created from the drone imagery where higher uh, elevations are dark red color. So you can see the road, uh, the raised road kind of cutting across the image there. And the lighter colors are low areas. And you can see pretty clearly a pipeline that runs across um, the image diagonally and then many, many seismic lines. And so we then took this as an opportunity to be able to assess what the potential greenhouse gas impact might be of some of these other disturbances. So this is some of the master's research of Julie Lovett, who then calculated what the potential might be for induced methane emissions due to the compression and the, the lower lying um, conditions that we get on seismic lines. And I think this is one of our big take homes from the project is that, you know, there's probably a lot of potential on the landscape to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that are being induced as uh, from development. But in order to mitigate those emissions, we first need to quantify them. And so we took some of that work we'd done on seismic lines and tried to scale that up to the pro provincial scale so we could even just get an idea of what the potential mitigation might be. So we determined that there were over 345,000 kilometers of seismic lines that cross just the peatland areas in Alberta. And this is a huge um, area of disturbed peatland, probably the largest uh, disturbance in the boreal, uh, covering over 1,900 square kilometers. And this does induce some methane emissions, but what we learned is that while it's not insignificant, it's also relatively small. So it really is only equivalent to about seven to 8% of all our land use methane emissions. And so there is some mitigation potential here, but we know it's not enormous. And there's a lot of other places that we could reduce methane emissions that might be more important. But there are many other disturbances like this on the landscape where we don't yet quantify well what their potential greenhouse gas emissions might be. So for example, how much carbon is being emitted from soils that are being um, moved around during mining? How are in situ uh, you know, well pads altering the surrounding hydrology and is that affecting peatland greenhouse gas emissions? And while we estimated methane emissions from seismic lines, what might be happening when we think about carbon stored in those soils as we explore and reclaim those lines. And this has led then to ongoing projects with a variety of different partners where we're now working together to build best management practices that take into account uh, greenhouse gas exchange and the mitigation potential of a lot of these activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, I, I really look forward to hearing more in the, in the panel discussion. I think at that time, we'll be able to dig, dig a little bit deeper 
All right. Um, well, we'll move on in the agenda. Our second presenter for today is Karen Hogan Kazira, who is the president of Varesco Solutions and is also, as we heard today, featured in episode three of ERA's podcast, Carbon Copy. Thank you very much for joining us today, Karen. Whenever you're ready, please. You've, you've shared your screen already. I don't know if your video is on, but uh, turn your video on, get your screen shared, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. All right. Can you see my screen? I can see you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you to the organizers for bringing our project to the fore to talk about the lessons learned. Um, this project was a partnership with uh, DSM, the developer of 3-nitroxypropanol. We'll call it 3-NOP from now on. A breakthrough technology that reduces enteric methane emissions from cattle, feedlot health management services, uh, the support from the Alberta Cattle Feeders Association, and collaboration with uh, Dr. Karen Boschman and Dr. Sean McGinn at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and their teams with proud support from Emission Reductions Alberta. Um, so, so the methane challenge was the call that we responded to. Um, to test this, this breakthrough technology. And I think we're all aware that uh, methane emissions from ruminants in particular um, are a significant proportion of the anthropogenic methane emissions that are accounted for globally uh, in the, on the planet. And this 3NOP feed additive that uh, DSM, Royal DSM out of the Netherlands has been working on um, since 2008, uh, was began sort of an in silico approach. So looking at, you know, what types of, of compounds could interact with the final enzyme in the methanogenic pathways of the bacteria in the rumen. Um, and they were successful in silico identifying what might destabilize that last little enzyme or coenzyme. And then looking at um, how effective it was in uh, vitro, so uh, with the Rusitec and extracting rumen uh, samples from the rumen and seeing how much it suppressed methane. And then finally, in vivo, so studies around the world uh, looking at um, experimenting, third party experimenters, and Canada's there with um, Dr. Beauchemin, who did some work early on with the RA funding on how effective this may be. So it, it's effective in all sorts of ruminants around the world and proven out that on average about 30% reduction in enteric methane emissions. So the scope of our project, because those were small scale studies, was to build upon what ERA had funded through Dr. Beauchemin's work at the smaller scale and see if we could test the commercial viability of it at an operational scale in a, in a commercial feedlot. And we looked at three things. What would be the impact of feeding 3NOP on cattle performance, health, and carcass characteristics? Can we confirm reductions in methane emissions that Dr. Bonchemin saw in her chamber studies at a commercial feedlot and test different techniques in measuring methane, and then demonstrate how we could at a commercial scale, uh, feed this additive to cattle. So we wound up with a, a somewhere between 12,000 and 15,000 head in a Southern Alberta feedlot uh, to conduct the trial on. And it is the largest single trial ever conducted um, on a methane reduction technology at this scale. Uh, and Dr. Beauchemin, you know, she was doing studies in small scale, leading the animals into the chambers feeding them um, and then measuring the amount of uh, methane emissions that would come off from the eruptation or breathing uh, out of the cattle. So this was a totally different situation to bring them into a, a commercial feedlot setting and see what we could do. So one of the things was, was confirming the methane emission reductions and assessing various techniques. Um, and so can we at a pen level detect a treatment effect um, and can we assess the ability to measure across seasons at a commercial scale? And what we found was there was excellent corroboration between a number of techniques that were utilized outside in all sorts of temperatures and freezing. Um, and so there was the typical open path laser that was used to scan control pens versus treatment pens. Um, and then also another technique, um, open path 
uh, for your transform infrared gas sensor used um, in, in, we call it the research row at the feedlot. And I've got some shots that'll show you that. But um, we wanted to compare the various ways of measuring. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Sean McGinn and uh, uh, his colleague, Dr. Tom Flesh, uh, this is research row at the, at the feedlot. Um, you can see the main thing here, housing the FTIR and then the paths that were used bouncing off the mirrors coming back. The wind speed was something we had to consider and the wind direction so we could only measure at certain days. Um, and then we had the three NOP pens separated by two pens that were, were clear so we wouldn't have you know, interference with methane emissions. Um, and then the control pens. That gives you an idea of the scale of what we were dealing with. Um, Here's some challenges where the equipment froze up during the, the colder months because we had to do it across all seasons. This study went on for about two years uh, with measurements at the feedlot and tippy toeing around the regular activities that were going on at the feedlot um, and trying not to get too much in their way. The other thing we did was use uh, a green feed system um, and you'll hear John Bassard talk about this as well. And it delivers a pellet and while the animal's eating, it is monitoring uh, the, the gas flow uh, and the methane and CO2 that the animal is respiring. And so this one was used to um, develop the dosage levels for corn because Dr. Boschman had worked mostly on barley. That's what we feed a lot of here in the province. Um, and so corn was something that we wanted to test and um, we did not have the dosages the basis for the dosages to, to build off of Karen's study. This just gives you a sense of, you know, that the feedlot is behind all of this. There were smaller scale pens that we set up the grow safe systems to measure the feed intake that was happening at, at those sites, as well as the green feed system where the animals would come in. Once they heard a pellet drop, they would line up and, and have their snack. Um, and John, John probably will talk a little bit more about that as well in his study. So this was a first on many fronts. Um, we wanted to test it on typical finishing diets and backgrounding diets in North America. So we had steam flight corn and we had um, dry rolled barley. Um, we looked at comparing you know, the control animals to the experimental animals and saw emissions of up to reductions of up to 80%, which added up over the time frame and the animals involved um, about 1500 tons of emission reductions equivalent to about taking 500 cars off the road for a year. Um, on the finishing diets, we saw a higher amount of reductions using the, the dosage, the 125 ppm um, in the feed that Karen Boschman had, had experimented with. Um, and in the backgrounding diets, which are higher forage-based diets that the animals are fed, uh, about a 17 to 26 percent reduction in methane stepwise diet from 150 to 200 ppm. So this, this represents um, a, a very promising breakthrough technology for managing enteric methane emissions um, on farm. The day-to-day -day practic practicalities, the, the lessons learned that we, we had to start out with was how do we formulate the product? Um, do, we, do we put it in liquid form? In the end, we decided that, uh, to do it on a silica basis. So the product was about a 10% concentration on a silica basis. We had to figure out how to mix it properly um, and the right dosage through a micro machine that, that feedlots use to deliver um, you know, vitamins and other types of, of additives to the, to the mix. Can we get it done properly? Can we get the right dosage mixed in the feed truck that, that goes out to the bunk? Um, and we sent samples back to DSM for testing and we, we were, did a very good job. Feedlot Health Management Services and the, and the, and the feedlot um, hit the mark very well in terms of concentration. Will animals respond the same? And this is where I think we had our aha moment. The, you know, the, this is a biological uh, experiment to some degree. So when Karen had her studies and she would bring the animals into the chamber, they were, they were not feeling comfortable. They weren't you know, eating as much as they would normally eat. When you get them into a, the herd setting, right? Where you've got 250 animals in a pen, they compete for their feed. And so they wound up eating a lot more than and getting a higher dose of what we were, we were expecting than the animals in her experiment. 
Um, and so we didn't see the same kind of response and performance or feed efficiency that we would have liked to. And then it's the, the question about what about that manure pile? Um, I'll just go quickly here. So here's our experimental row right here. And in May, the team went out to do their measurements and the feedlot had to do something when they were mucking out the pens. Normally there's a big manure pile here. All of a sudden that manure pile showed up and it was like, oh my God, that's gonna just disrupt our measurements with the wind speed. There's gonna be methane coming off that manure pile. And so we had to suck it up and try to find funding to move that manure pile. And it's expensive to move that amount of manure. They must've spent all week piling it up. Um, and then the, the, the other lessons learned is that when you've got that constrained regulatory environment that you have to apply for experimental certificates with a product that's not approved. So a TRL, you know, six, seven, eight, um, you have to stick to that, that, that experimental certificate. So we couldn't optimize the dose to find that situation where you get a better feed conversion efficiency that Karen Boschman saw in her study. Um, so we were restricted by that. Um, and there's still optimization, I think, once the, the product is approved for use in Canada to be able to optimize it. But um, having said that, um, in the impact could be quite huge. So Tech Edmonton ERA uh, provides support to project uh, uh, developers in, in, in their um, grant process with Tech Edmonton. So we had them do a little bit of a, an economic study and so Alberta is the green here above the blue. So we have, you know, 60% of the operations in terms of backgrounding in Alberta. And when it comes to finishing, we finish a lot of cattle for the country in Alberta, two large packers and smaller ones as well. And so if we were to think about what this might extend beyond, you know, an impact for Alberta, just roughly, if we were to feed that and, and have large scale adoption of this product across the finishing side of, of the equation, it could be between one to 1.5 megatons of CO2 e reductions per year. So not insignificant. And with that, I think I'll turn it back to Mark. <laughs> Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, I will say it's always a pleasant surprise when the results get better when you scale it up out of the lab and put it into the field. So thanks very much for that presentation. I, again, I look forward to hearing more and talking a little bit more during the Q&A session. All right, our third presenter for today is Dr. John Basarab, who is an adjunct professor at the University of Alberta and a senior research scientist at Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. Thank you so much for joining us today, John. Over to you whenever you're ready. It looks like your slides are showing up now. So as long as your video is on, take it away whenever you like. Oh, that's excellent. And um, thank you for the invitation to uh, participate. And uh, thank you, Karen, for covering uh, some of the background. And um, that, that really frees me up to, uh, to uh, talk more about lessons learned. Um, the project that we had to do to, that we dealt with was um, was some years ago, and it it really tested some of the initial technology that Karen used in her study, which would have been the open path lasers, and um, the uh, the uh, the green feed system, the emission monitoring system. This project is funded about fifty percent by Emission Reduction Alberta and 50% Alberta Agriculture Strategic Research and Development Program. And it had scientists um, from the University of Alberta, from Livestock Gentech, uh, from the University of Manitoba, uh, uh, Alberta Ag, and uh, um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And so it had uh, quite, a, uh, quite a group of, of scientists that were associated with it. The project really was about looking at methane emissions from inefficient and efficient cattle. And in the beef industry, how we measure that is um, a term that we call residual feed intake. Please don't remember that for now, uh, but it just means that it's a way of measuring uh, feed efficiency in cattle because there are some cattle that are efficient. They do a really good job with what they consume, just like a really efficient car. And there's some cattle that essentially eat what we call for fun. They consume a lot of feed, but, feed, but they don't do much with it. 
Um, essentially, we had two objectives. Uh, one was uh, to look at two on-farm systems for measuring enteric methane emissions. Uh, one was called, of course, the green feed system or green feed emission monitoring system. And of course, the open path laser system that uh, Karen talked about. The gold standard, I guess we could call it that for measuring methane in um, ruminants or dairy and beef cattle is essentially in respiratory chambers where animals are brought into a controlled environmental facility. You can see these little little doors here that, uh, that cattle go into and they are in there in a tie stall with feed and water um, and all the comforts of life for 48 hours when, in which all the gases are measured. Karen talked about how the green feed system works. Essentially, you're using an attractant, a feed pellet or a reward to get the animal to come up to a fume hood on wheels, positive airflow draws, uh, the breaths and eructations up a, up a sampling pipe and at the bottom of this uh, particular uh, instrumentation there's an infrared detector. The secondary objective of course is to measure feed intake and enteric methane emissions from our different efficiency phenotypes characteristics uh, in cows and heifers. I didn't mention though while there is um, a fair amount of methane coming from cattle in feedlots the vast majority of methane and greenhouse gases occur in the cattle that are on farm, the grazing cows and the wintering cows. Essentially here, we've got the, the grow safe system that measures the individual feed intake of an animal uh, every second of every day. And then over here in this particular pen, we would have a green feed system that was, was operating 24 seven summer and winter. And here is a nice shot of it uh, working very well in the middle of the winter. Uh, in the summertime, we took those systems out onto pasture. There's a picture of it right here of how it's operating on pasture with solar panels. And over on the side here with these funky looking graphs, you'll see that this is really what the data looks like. I'll draw your attention to the bottom graph, which is essentially methane emission. And here you can easily see the methane from breaths, burps or eructations. That would be what we would call the rumen methane. And this little bar at the bottom, sort of the difference between the baseline and the, the upper, a little bit of upper level, that's the methane that's coming from the lungs. There is some methane that's absorbed from the portal blood supply uh, into the, uh, the lungs and then respired out. Of course, if we're looking at CO2, you'll see that the graph is, is a little bit different. So lots of these measurements get taken on many cows over many days, and that's how we establish a methane uh, mission. Uh, at the same time, we looked at the open path laser. Karen talked about this, but it's a really neat design. What we had is um, this four path, path configuration with one open path laser that shines off some mirrors or reflects off some mirrors that are set in the middle here and then some reflectors. And essentially with this type of system, you can um, have this robotic uh, open path laser moving back and forth down these lines and getting many measures of our groups of cattle. Efficient, let's say this group here is an efficient group and that a group down there is inefficient. Way at the end, you see a, uh, a green feed system and there's a similar one down here. So, you know, what we've got to do is talk about, you know, the bottom line, did, did efficient cattle type, in other words, did low RFI cattle, those are efficient ones, eat less and produce less methane? The, simple, the direct answer is yes. And if we set up this, this type of uh, uh, selection program or uh, practice for, to select for fish feed efficiency, even at a very moderate rate of, of our annual rate of genetic progress of 0.8%, this identifies what it means to the industry. In other words, the impact and benefit to the industry. So a moderate size feedlot with 1600 market ready feeder cattle would save about um, 500 tons of barley per year from selecting for feed efficiency or using feed efficient cattle. For a cow-calf operation that's uh, quite large, about 800 cows, 
you'd save uh, 50 round bales. This picture in front of you is 50 round bales, let us say. And if you expanded this to the industry, you would, you would see that you could save on an annual basis about 79,000 tons of, of, of feed a year. And in terms of the cow-calf industry, which has many more animals, about 260,000 um, um, round bales. The feed savings on a Canadian basis amounts to about uh, 25 to $50 million. In carbon credits, it's around 2.5 to $5 million, assuming $30 a ton for CO2E, this is going up. On an annual basis, that would account, amount to about 80 to 160,000 tons of CO2 equivalents per year. You can see there's a lot of uncertainty in that, but uh, that's just the way, the way it goes. It would depend on adoption rates. So let's move on to lessons learned. Genetic selection is different then genetic or genomic selection is different than a feed additive. A feed additive has to be supplied um, every day to the animals and that can sometimes be a challenge. So genetic selection will be permanent, cumulative, but slow. So that's, that's important to realize. At the present price of carbon, um, a practice incentivizing a practice change, the price is too low. And so right now the practice change will be driven by, you know, uh, net return or profitability or feed savings as the price of carbon increases, of course, that, that will have a bigger impact. Some of the scale up challenges, of course, um, are, are going to be around record, record keeping. You're going to have to have inventory of each animal that receives the, the practice or the mitigating practice. And as Karen uh, pointed out, um, variable dose responses. So one of the things we did learn because we had to get a, have a, an attractant to get the animal to go and get a, a methane measurement, it's kind of like vaccination, you need a, you need a reward to go get your vaccination, um, that um, there was a lot of vari variability in response. And so there would be some animals that would just love to get their treat every day and others that just wouldn't have any part of it for various reasons. So essentially the message is that we need to take an integrated approach that looks at many, many mitigating practices at the same time. Genetic selection or genomic selection for feed efficiency. There's new work on um, maintaining high hybrid vigor or heterosis within the herd. Of course, feed additives, and Karen talked about one, but there are others. A managing for reduced age at slaughter, increasing calf crop percentage, improving diet, and then pasture management practices that, that really increase carbon storage. This bottom, this last one about precision agriculture, this, is, this has a lot of implication in terms of the automation of that data capture particularly as it relates to, to grazing. So thank you for your attention and that's it. And I'll turn it back over to the moderator. Uh, thank you very much, John. That was a fantastic way to close off the presentations as we move into the panel discussion. So uh, these have all been enlightening presentations, I should say, and, and really lay the foundation for today's discussion. Just as a reminder for the audience, please pass along your questions for the panelists by entering them into the Q&A panel or simply by upvoting or voting for the questions that you like the most. At this point, I'll invite our panelists to all turn on their camera. It looks like they're one step ahead of me and we'll get started with the conversation. Uh, I know there was a lot to cover in only 10 minutes or so, and so I'd like to start by exploring the path forward and the bigger picture for these fascinating innovations. I know each of you, each of you touched on this a little bit, some um, per perhaps more than others, but I think my first question is for each of the presenters, Maria, Karen, and John. Tell me a little bit about the path forward from where we are today. For example, when might, when might we see these innovations or the products of these innovations in the marketplace or, or paint us, if you will, 
a bit of a bigger picture here. And I'm going to start in reverse order. Um, John, fresh on your mind, you were just talking about it on your last slide. So did you, did you want to go first here? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Um, well, it, this, this has started already in the, um, in the beef industry and also in the dairy industry. Um, genetic selection and the use of genomic technology to enhance that genetic selection is already occurring both in the beef and the dairy industry because of projects like this. Um, and so um, that is occurring. So you can find genetic values for bulls that uh, will tell you that this is a feed efficient bull. However, other things that are going on, there's, there's, there's other things that we can do with genomics. Um, we can genomically, almost like Ancestry.com, determine the breed composition of a animal, of a cow. And what's so significant about that, it's not that we know its breed composition or its ancestry, we know how much hybrid vigor the animal has. The more hybrid vigor an animal has, that means the more fertile it will be, the more resistant to disease and the bigger productivity. So the carbon intensity will be reduced. So there's many genomic technologies that are moving forward and bringing cost-effective solutions to the industry. So you can imagine, yes, you'll go out and do an ancestry.com application for 35 or $50 or whatever it is. But if you've got thousands of cattle, that's going to be very expensive. Well, there's other technologies that we, as in livestock Gentech, are bringing to the table that will reduce that cost so that a commercial producer can use some of these technologies, as an example. Yeah, thanks, John. Karen, did you want to jump in here? Sure. Um, I think I mentioned in my presentation, Mark, that um, we did not wind up with like hitting the sweet spot of, you know, the, the right dosage that would, as Karen found in her smaller studies, wind up with a feed conversion efficiency of five to six, seven percent and, and a, a balance on the methane emission reductions. And so, you know, once that product is approved, then I think we can start to look at how we would optimize that because it does hold potential. And I think, you know, DSM came to us in Alberta because their business model was not only feed conversion efficiency, but also carbon markets and carbon pricing, realizing that the incentive provided through a carbon pricing system, like an offset system, and our, our feed, you know, our fed cattle protocol that we have in Alberta, it would be a perfect vehicle for that once the regulatory approval happens with, with Health Canada um, and the veterinarian directorate, um, it, it can really catalyze uptake and scale. And I think you've got a sense of that, you know, if we were to deploy this at a large scale, it's not an insignificant amount just in the finishing sector, you know, one to 1 1.5 megatons of CO2 per year across our, our country. If we can crack the nut on the cow calf side, where you know we have many many cows, that's where a lot of the emissions happen because they're eating a more forage roughage based diet, so more methane coming off, as John pointed out. Then that would be you know where uh, uh, the golden goose would lie if we wanted to get that 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 particular delivery mechanism that John's working on in the grazing sector. So so we still have work to do. It's absolutely promising. Like I said, it is probably the most important breakthrough technology that it exists out there for managing methane emissions from cattle, but we have a little bit more tweaking to do. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Maria, over to you. Yeah, so I think like when we think about peatland emission reduction potential, we still probably have like the, the biggest barrier to implementation is probably that we're not properly quantifying what the emissions are. So we don't we can't really reduce them. And there's no incentive to reduce them if we're not really accounting for them properly. Um, and this is a well-known problem that you know, is sort of an on, ongoing activity with for both Natural Resources Canada and Environment and Climate Change Canada is to get these, um, you know, to get a better estimation and accounting of what are the actual carbon emissions coming from soil disturbances 
um, on the landscape. So right now we account for the carbon in the trees that we remove, for example, if we make a seismic line, but not necessarily if we're changing methane emissions or losing carbon from the soil. So this is an area of sort of ongoing model development and research uh, in the government. And then that's when we might start to see implementation of better management practices to actually mitigate those emissions. Yeah, thank you each very much. So maybe one more quick question for, for each of you before I um, start asking some questions from the audience. As it based on what you learned in these projects and the broader efforts to advance innovation, if you could maybe briefly, what advice would you offer to other entrepreneurs or researchers in terms of advancing this type of innovation toward commercialization or toward some sort of market uptake? This is open for whoever maybe, wants to jump yeah. in first. Go I'll, ahead. I'll start and I think it probably applies to the others as well as like that partnership is just so important, right? Like, so we need to have the people at the table that can actually apply those technologies that, um, you know, in, in my case, when we're thinking land use that are driving policy, that are working on the inventories. So partnership and really talking to people and getting different perspectives, I think is really critical um, as you're starting to think about projects and, and how to push them forward. Yeah, I would uh, totally agree. And, and um, I would say the solution is quite complicated. Uh, and, 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 tr and, and it's not just a, a silver bullet kind of a fix. There's um, many technologies, so many levels of expertise need to be brought to the table. And an integrated approach must be taken to have any impact. So as you saw Karen talk about it, I mean, you know, there's, there's challenges there, but there's challenges on all fronts. And uh, I think if you take an integrated approach where you're applying many te technologies, there's a chance to have a significant impact on, on um, carbon intensity of production or any of these systems. I just, I think I'd echo that, Mark. Um, it's a silver buckshot, not a silver bullet approach. But I think in terms of the silver buckshot approach too, I think we're going to have to use all the levers at our disposal. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit, I think, that that has occurred in the past. But, you know, these technologies are not going to be cheap. Um, and we're going to need to think about how we incentivize if we want these things to happen at scale. And I mean, carbon markets are one mechanism. There are other mechanisms that can be brought to bear, um, but all the levers we can at our advantage to move this forward. Yeah. And thank you ERA for supporting these kinds of endeavors. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. So we've got some really, really good questions coming in through the Q&A panel. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with one. This is probably, it, it's not indicated who's directed for, but maybe I'll ask either Karen or John to weigh in on this one. It's actually a fascinating question I hadn't thought of around the downstream impacts of feed additives for biogas production in digesters. Um, any, any thoughts around how that could impact the material that goes into a biodigester and the, the, the biogas quality or, or even effects on, on the, the biogas processes? It's an excellent question. Um, and I do recall that um, in our collaboration with DSM, we've been working with them since 2015, they were thinking about it as a lagoon additive, right, to suppress methane emission because the, the same methanogens are active in the lagoons. Um, but they haven't done too much research in, onto that yet because thinking of adding it in bulk to a, a manure situation storage it's pretty, you know, that that's something that they're not going to focus on. So I think there's some research there. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Dr. Jing Hao at Agriculture and Agriculture Canada was looking at the excretion side to see what sorts of impacts might happen on suppressing methane um, from the excreted manure. But I've lost track. So I think it is an area of research and a good question to explore. Yeah, I, I would uh, I would echo that, Karen. I mean, the same thing's going on with biochar. 
Um, I'm not sure we need to worry about that with things like seaweed, but maybe, or lemongrass, not sure. But th <laughs> that, that, is that is definitely an area that, that needs um, further work. Mm -hmm. Good question. Perfect. Well, thank, thanks both. Um, I'm going to jump to another question. This is a, a little bit of a change in direction, and it's around regulation. Now, the, the question is is sort of geared toward agriculture, but I'm I'm actually, if it's all right, I'm going to broaden the question out a little bit uh, and and bring each of our panelists in on this. So the way the question is worded is, where do you think emission regulations will go with respect to agriculture? Do you believe there will be implementation of emission regulations in the future, provincially or federally? Now, I, I actually, I'm going to, um, I'd like to ask um, John and Karen certainly to, to weigh in on that. But I'm also curious from Maria's perspective around, even in Alberta, whether the, the current regulatory environment in, in the AER um, has has any impacts on what you're seeing with respect to the, the disturbance of peatlands, and and whether you have any insights or predictions, if you will, around where the regulatory environment might go in the future uh, in in that regard. So, anyone who'd like to to jump in, please feel free to go ahead. Maybe I can start from the non-agriculture side and then Karen and John can, can, can discuss the agriculture sort of back to back. Um, so carbon storage as a function is, is clearly recognized. So when we think about reclamation criteria for peatlands, for example, um, it's a mentioned function, but it's not necessarily something you're gonna measure and report on, right? So it's a goal of something that, that should be returned in, in, a, in a, you know, a good reclamation. Uh, but there's no regula regulations that, that you should have to measure that or quantify it. And, and probably that would be the biggest problem sort of even in a carbon offset situation is that we don't have sort of good, it's quite time consuming to measure that carbon flux and, and to verify it. Um, but already at the federal level, there is moves towards uh, environmental impact assessments now requiring an estimation of what greenhouse gas emissions that is going to induce on the land base. Um, so I think the regulations are already moving in that direction. And I, right now, I guess like our biggest problem is likely that because we're not estimating those emissions well, you know, mitigating them is one thing, but we don't even really have them in our estimates of anthropogenic emissions yet. So we're like maybe not doing as well as we think we're doing um, if we're not incorporating the land base emissions properly. So it's gonna be important from a regulatory point of view to start getting those better represented in the inventory. And then we can start mitigating them. Yeah, I, I, I only have one comment. I'm not a politician or a legislator, so, so but I'm not going to comment in that regard. What I'm going to say is that both all livestock industries, and in particular the beef and the dairy industry, are being proactive in this front. There's the Canadian Brown Table on sustainable beef production that is doing a tremendous job in in sustainable practices in agriculture and, and researching and funding those and that work needs to be continue in a very um, um, uh, practical fashion a uh, very, very intense fashion uh, there is no doubt that somewhere along the line uh, there's going to be regulation that has an impact on what we might call large final emitters in the agriculture sector as well. Karen, would you have any further thoughts there? Yeah, just to build on Maria's point, um, uh, you know, there's a significant um, movement, I'd say globally, around um, establishing a methane budget for the planet. And there are um, remote sensing um, initiatives, methane sats and others, that are going to be assessing globally from satellites where our major uh, sources of emissions of methane are, rice paddies, peatlands, um, you know, oil and gas installations to get a better handle on that methane budget. And a lot of this is driven by um, the global warming potential metric called GWP star, which says, well, methane exists for about 10 to 20 years in the atmosphere, it's not a long lived 
uh, greenhouse gas. And then it is converted through photooxidation in the atmosphere to CO2. And so I think there is a, a, global, a global movement to understand the methane cycle and the methane budget better. But in order to be able to mitigate and manage appropriately for short-lived gases, we need to understand the total budget. Mm -hmm. So I think that's gonna be happening in the next five years. So watch this space. Um, as far as regulating the, the agricultural sector, um, it's something that, you know, people, well, New Zealand is, um, but New Zealand, you look at their methane, their methane emissions, there's 50, 60% of their country's inventory. Um, and so they've decided to regulate without flexibility. Um, probably be one of the jurisdictions where 3NOP is accepted uh, from a regulatory standpoint. Um, and the EU is close to accepting 3NOP as well. So we're going to need these kinds of technologies and feed additives, but I don't see us regulating the agriculture sector um, in Canada or North America anytime soon. I think the focus, as John has put in his last slide, is that we could probably get to a 30, 40, maybe even 50% reduction in carbon intensity in our ruminant sector with all of the suggestions that he has done. And that is definitely where the industry is going. The CRS, the Canadian Roundtable on Sustainable Beef has set aggressive targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And given all that we've heard today, I'm pretty certain we can get there. Perfect. Well, thank you each. So the next question I'm going to pop, this one is um, addressed to Karen. And uh, I mean, certainly I think others could could weigh in as it relates to, to what, what they're working on, but specifically as worded, Karen, what do you see as the biggest challenges to scaling the product into larger commercial settings? I think that um, once we get over the regulatory approvals process, I think there's gonna be a lot of investigation and you know, optimizing that product. I think it's going though, this is not low hanging fruit, right? This is, we don't know what the price point is because it isn't at the stage where it is being mass produced. But we are going to need those policy levers. We're going to need things like, you know, a carbon pricing and an offset system um, and other types of things to incentivize uptake. If we, I think what excites the industry more is if we could demonstrate the improved feed efficiency that Karen saw in her smaller trials, right? That might tip the scales, but I do think it's going to need both. I think it's going to need, you know, we're, we're going to see some good feed conversion efficiencies and we're going to need to see the uplift from the carbon offset market. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I don't know, John, did you want to jump in on that? Or I can move to the next question if you like. Yeah, just a, a small comment. Um, the, the price of carbon, and I, I know people are not going to like this, but the price of carbon is not near high enough to incentivize some of these practice changes. So therefore it has to come from a different way. It has to come from increases in uh, profitability, feed savings, et cetera, animal welfare, food quality, so on and so forth. Uh, just as an example, we try to, you know, when we do genetic selection, we, we use traits that are heritable and are economically important. And so we try to put a methane trait into a multi-trait selection index, it would only come into the index or replace an existing traditional trait when the price of carbon got to be $750 a ton, <laughs> right? Which was, which was extremely high and, and just out of reach. And so that just, uh, I think, um, emphasizes some of the difficulty of scaling up. And, and, and making some of this occur. I just, I just add to that though. I mean, you know, the, the beef carbon that we've been able to generate in this province with feedlot health management and Trimble 
they're doing it. Um, they're doing it. They've generated about, it's on the Alberta Emissions Offset Registry in about four projects now or pools of carbon. They're doing it with, you know, incremental efficiency strategies. And when we piloted the, the work to improve the, the fed cattle protocol, it worked out to about 0 0.06 tons per head with, in a feedlot, with the, you know, improving the performance and the feed efficiencies, et cetera, that are it, it disposed at their disposal right now. If 3NOP was on the market, it would increase that by an order of magnitude. So from 0 0.06 tons per head to 0 0.6. And it's an easily integrated into a feedlot. We've proven that at a commercial scale. So it could drive things. They managed to do it at prices that were 20 and $30 a ton. So it's, you know, it, it could drive things is my point. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, so I've got a, I've got a question for just a, a quick, fairly quick question for Dr. Strack, and then I want to end off um, with maybe a couple cl closing thoughts from each of you. But um, for for Maria, I'm I I, I like this question. Um, I'll be interested to see how you react, and I'm I'm almost a little bit surprised to see some people voting up a question about emission factors. But nevertheless, um, the, the question is: Do you feel that the work you've done can be translated into emission factors based on, for example, the number and type of trees removed and maybe the type and amount of peatlands that were disturbed. Any, any thoughts around how that could be translated into actual emission factors for quantification? Yeah, I mean, I think it could. We're, we're always a little hesitant um, to do it for based on sort of, a, we had, we measured at two sites. Um, and you know, it, it's really easy to turn that into an emission factor that you apply for the whole country, but is it right? Probably not. Um, but that's how emission factors get built, right? Um, you know, I've worked on some of the emission factors in the, in the wetland supplement that's being used currently. Um, so it's definitely like, that's always our goal actually is to create data that can go into developing emission factors or, or in Canada, this work is probably more likely to go into um, the Canadian model forestry models um, so that these can be accounted properly or more properly. And, and you know, <laughs> it's, it's a continuous improvement process, right? Um, but you have to start somewhere. So yeah, you know, we, we, we think about that. We think about how we can upscale it, but, you know, we always want more data, but I'm also, you know, pretty convinced now that we need to use the data we have so that we can start to take some action. Yeah, thanks. That's a really well said. Okay, so we're we're running out of time. There are some really great questions here. I'd love to keep going, but I'm going to ask if you could each maybe in 30 seconds or so um, offer any concluding remarks or, or thoughts that you want to leave with our audience today. Uh, let's start with Karen. Well, I, I recall being in a, a workshop with you guys, um, Red Deer. Um, I think January, February last year, before all hell broke loose. And, um, and Steve was standing up there closing up the session. He said, innovation is hard. <laughs> it's always stuck with me. It is, but you've got to stick with it, right? You, you know, you've got your hurdles. We've got some lessons learned. We're not going to give up on this thing. Um, and just tenacity, tenacity, tenacity. Wow, thanks, Karen. Very great remarks. Uh, let's go to John next. Uh, yeah, um, of course, I'd reiterate what Karen said, uh, to jump into the risk. And uh, ma many of these technologies are, are proven. They're, they're, they're proven, I mean, just all the details of how to operationalize them. So I think one of the advice I would say is that we need to reduce methane emissions. We need to improve production efficiency. Um, uh, so, so there's technologies there, use them. They're innovative, use them uh, and scale them up. And, and, uh, and industry will be the ones that will tell us how these things work, but, but uh, definitely you know, start, take the leap. Yeah, thanks very much, John. Maria, final word to you. 
<laughs> wow, that's a lot of pressure. And I'm maybe going to just switch gears slightly, but you know, we talked a bit about the price of carbon and and how you know that may help in some cases. It may it may be hard. It may be have to re be really expensive for some of these innovations in agriculture. And and I think that's maybe even more so when we think about land management. That you know, by far and away, the biggest way to reduce emissions is conservation. And if you're conserving a peatland that has diamonds underneath it, the price of carbon is going to have to be pretty high. Mm -hmm. So we have to make some hard decisions about, you know, the inherent value of some of these ecosystems and the other co-benefits that they provide um, and, and commit to long-term conservation in, in areas of the country. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. I learned a lot, I can say, and I'm sure our audience did as well. Um, I very much appreciate uh, your, your time today. And thank, thank you for both the presentations and for engaging in the discussion. And so with that great momentum, we're going to switch gears a little bit pull ourselves uh, out of the weeds at least uh, a little bit for a couple minutes and move on to our Spark speaker series presentation. But let me, let me set the stage a bit before I turn it over to Rob. Um, we know full well that funding alone will not result in the greenhouse gas reductions and economic opportunities that we want and we need in the province of Alberta. Innovators, entrepreneurs, industrial operators face significant challenges and barriers on the journey toward commercialization and marketplace adoption. So we heard this loud and clear from our panelists today. Now Spark, a conference we held in 2017 and 2019, and now manifesting itself as a speaker series, was always aimed at bringing clean tech researchers and innovators together with representatives from the business community, from government, and from across the innovation system. Uh, it has been a way for us to feature thought leaders from a variety of industries and to share their insights, their ideas and experiences. Our hope is to help inspire and accelerate Alberta's transformation to a lower carbon economy. And today is certainly no exception. Already today, we've learned a bit about the $33 million ERA is committing to 17 projects through our food, farming and forestry challenge. And of course, our brilliant panelists shared the lessons that they've learned along their own way. Now, our next speaker is a fitting culmination for today's event. Rob Syke has more than 40 years of experience as an outspoken champion of agriculture. He is a distinguished agrologist, professional consultant, and a serial entrepreneur. Rob has been hailed as an agriculture futurist with unparalleled insight into where the industry is headed. He, he started his career from a mixed farm in Alberta. From these beginnings, he has gone on to advise the likes of Bill Gates, the Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria, a, a country with more than 200 million people, and most recently, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations Committee for world food security. He has founded and invested in over 15 companies and is currently the CEO of Agvisor Pro, a connectivity and resource platform for agriculture. Rob is humorous, energetic, and impactful. If you haven't seen his videos uh, on TED Talks or Big Idea Speakers or Mind Meld or many of the others, you should look them up. There's a bunch available on YouTube, actually. So Rob, whenever you're ready, I'll turn it over to you and the stage is yours. Well, thanks, Mark, and uh, hi, everybody, and uh, congratulations to Minister Nixon for the announcement of $33 million worth of uh, project uh, support. That's great news. Uh, um, I get to speak today to you all, and certainly there are a lot more people qualified on the uh, topic of carbon than myself. However, I'm going to raise a, a number of issues or ideas. Uh, I'm going to enjoy doing that. And um, also, I want to just highlight a couple of things that just were announced. The, the federal budget came out. I know there's a lot of farmers out there very uh, frustrated uh, with the lack of recognition that grain needs to be dried and it takes uh, carbon, to, it takes uh, natural gas and propane to dry grain. Um, and so uh, $100 million has been announced uh, for money to go back to uh, farmers for grain drying. Another $50 million 
for farmers to increase uh, grain dryers uh, and efficiency on grain dryers on farm and $200 million for, uh, clim uh, for on-farm climate action. Not sure what that means. Anyways, the federal uh, budget recognizes agriculture and I, I think that's good. I think it's a good starting point that agriculture, I think, is a huge, uh, um, uh, a huge part of the solution uh, when you consider uh, the mitigation and removal of greenhouse gases on the planet. Um, in the book that I wrote, Food 5.0, I uh, asked the question, you know, uh, what, what do we need from agriculture? And the reality is, as long as we have human beings on the planet, agriculture uh, must be infinitely sustainable. Now, what does sustainability mean in agriculture? What does infinite sustainability mean? What does sustainability mean? I think it's a good question. It's it, everywhere I go right now, the, the topic of environment, sustainability, governance, ESG shows up over and over again. And to me, sustainability really is surrounding, you know, four issues, primarily uh, soil health. So we have to have healthy soil if agriculture is going to be infinitely sustainable. Water use efficiency, increasing the ability of us to use fresh water to produce food uh, would be important. Mitigation of greenhouse gases from agriculture, um, fairly recent, call it the last three, three decades, two decades, this has come into our psyche, but uh, one that's worthwhile in terms of conversation, especially for this uh, conference. And uh, so you've got soil uh, health, water use efficiency, greenhouse gas balance, and, and the one that most people forget when you talk about sustainability is farm viability. Because if farms aren't viable, if they're not thriving, they're just trying to survive, uh, they're not interested in sustainability. So farms, farms globally need to be uh, viable in order to adopt long-term sustainability initiatives. And I wrote a paper a long time ago around Redbox, Greenbox, which is, uh, Redbox was direct subsidies to farmers in times of calamity. and by and large society has a problem with red box subsidies, but green box subsidies are entirely differently. So you have cattle that have been grazing in a stream and society says they don't want the cows pooping in the stream anymore. So the farmer says, well, I'll do it, but I have to have a fence and I have to drill a well so we're not having the cattle go in the stream. Well, that's a green box. If society wants that, there's red box and green box support for agriculture. My journey, in uh, this area of uh, sustainability and carbon really began with a simple question back in the year 2000, 2001. I asked Elston Solberg, who is a, a, a preeminent agronomist, and I asked Elston a simple question. If we increase soil organic matter by 1%, how much carbon? And Elston says, well, you know, if you can define what organic matter is, but let's say it's completely decomposed organic matter in soils, that would be about 58 or 60 percent carbon, meaning that in a six inch slice of soil, um, there's about 12,000 pounds of carbon, which would be equivalent to 20 metric tons of carbon dioxide sequestered in the soil. So the question that we posed back then was, you know, really, hmm, so how long would it take a farmer to increase organic matter by 1 percent, and then could he prove it? And that began the journey that resulted in the establishment of AgriTrend Aggregation. AgriTrend Aggregation in 2007 uh, became Trimble Aggregation. Uh, so Karen alluded to the uh, management or the, uh, the uh, uh, transactions dealing with feedlot health. That was a part of the legacy or we started that way back in 2007. Now what's going on today in the world is you have a lot of ideologies and you have a lot of Hollywood going on. The vilification of agriculture, uh, especially livestock agriculture, is rampant and uh, I think it requires a little bit of clarification. Um, on the uh, 13th to the 15th of October, as mentioned, I got to attend a three-day session with about a thousand delegates um, to, from the FAO and the, the United Nations. I had a chance to talk to them about agriculture. One of the things that I observed over the three days was the vilification of uh, North American agriculture. The fact that somehow North American agriculture wasn't being seen as somehow sustainable. 
Well, other than Argentina, I don't know of any other place in North America that's done a better job of adopting no tillage practice in Western Canada and Saskatchewan in particular. And when you think about the fact that by reducing tillage, every time we till, we fracture the soil, we destroy organic matter, we blast off uh, uh, CH4, we blast off nitrous oxide, so the mitigation of tillage. Now, there's a lot of talk right now about how come farmers haven't been more recognized. Alberta is the only jurisdiction to recognize the fact that farmers have been sequestering carbon in soils with zero till strategies. And, and now I understand that that's going to be done away with here at the end of the, at the, end of the calendar year. However, when you're, when you're listening to these people from the United Nations and the FAO talk, there's a lot of ideology posturing. Um, and I hear a lot of philosophical words. I hear the words regenerative. I hear the words organic. I hear the words agroecology. I heard the word natural farming, uh, conventional, GMO, non-GMO. What, what is sustainable? Well, at the end of the day, I think we should get away from religion and all these ideologies and we should talk about outcomes. And Karen mentioned this, the measurement side of the equation. Um, our practices should be agronomically based and should be outcome based, shouldn't be ideology. And it's really interesting when you listen to what's going on and the posturing that goes on. So regenerative agriculture talks about the integration of livestock, particularly ruminants, in the farming system. Well, if you listen to Hollywood, uh, ruminant livestock is killing the planet. Well, what, what's actually right? Well, it should be based on, I think, outcome technology. So I wanted to touch a little bit on a couple of things. Karen mentioned something that was really quite important. It was the GWP. In 1990, GWP assigned greenhouse gas factors called the GWP 100. Carbon dioxide was given a factor of one. In other words, one greenhouse gas warming-ish, whatever it is. Uh, methane was assigned a factor of 28, and nitrous oxide was assigned a factor of 265. But what Karen talked about is really important, and that is that these greenhouse gases do not all behave the same way in the atmosphere. The half-life of carbon dioxide is 100 years. The half-life of methane is uh, 10 years. So when you have, in the background, I have crops that are growing. Let's say we're gonna go with a barley crop here, grasses. So uh, you have carbon dioxide in the air. A plant will suck in carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis, produce sugar, starches, etc. The cow, eats the grass, and the cow burps out methane. Now methane is more greenhouse gassing than carbon dioxide, but it has a half-life of 10 years versus 100 years. So that methane converts back into carbon dioxide fairly quickly. The, the only way you can have more methane from the livestock sector is if you have more and more and more livestock, and yet the peak of the livestock herd in North America was 1971. So we have a lot of Hollywood uh, type of uh, vilification of an industry when we need to start thinking not only of the, the, the GWP 100, but what she alluded to, Karen talked about the GWP star, is how does it behave in the atmosphere? And uh, CH4, methane, is a short-lived greenhouse gas, and it's converted back into carbon dioxide over a period of period of time, a uh, very short period of time. The other thing I wanted to bring up, and it was brought up by, um, uh, by Maria, uh, when she says that uh, when you cut down trees, you have to take into account the carbon that's stored in the trees. Well, some work was done by a, uh, an engineer and a farmer named uh, Fraser McPhee. Fraser used the national, uh, Canadian National Inventory Report from 1990 to 2010 to look at the greenhouse gas balance of agriculture in Canada. Total greenhouse gas emissions from all sources of agriculture in Canada on an annual basis are 60 million metric tons. That includes, that includes enteric fermentation, ag soils, manure, losses from fertilizer, um, all that stuff, the liming, everything. So 60 metric tons, 60 million metric tons goes up into the atmosphere from agriculture. Fair dinkum, we understand that. 
Carbon sequestration uh, in soils uh, is uh, said in the report, uh, we pull 11 million metric tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the soils as a result of farming. So 60 up, 11 down. What nobody takes into account is the 79 million metric tons of carbon that farmers put into the crops that they grow. Majority of our crops are exported around the world. If we account for the carbon that's in forestry, should we not also account for carbon that's in the grain that we export all over the globe to everyone who buys our wheat and canola and everything else? So the question is, when you consider that, it's just a question, um, if you consider that, um, farmers uh, store about, they're 100, they, 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 they bring in 132% of their emissions each year when you consider grain. And if you consider the uh, soil, 150%. So agriculture is 30 million metric tons to the positive if you pull all that together. So I'm gonna wrap up here with some good news. Some good news on the front with respect to technology. And I'm a member of the A100, the Alberta 100. I would like to see agriculture and high tech come together to solve some of these problems. Biotechnology increasing water use efficiency, increasing salinity resistance, increasing root mass, increasing nitrogen fixation from non-nitrogen fixing crops, all requires the, the possibility of us using technology, uh, genetic engineering, gene, uh, gene editing. Uh, we're all lining up for our uh, mRNA uh, shots uh, for COVID. I just had mine and so uh, all of that's being embraced and yet somehow biotechnology for agriculture is being vilified. Precision Ag was brought up. This is an awesome way to make sure that we're allocating inputs and putting inputs at the right place at the right time. Quantum computing uh, is really interesting. When you think about quantum computing, being able to take the Haber-Bosch process is quite energy inefficient and being able to take uh, the nitrogen that's in the air as inert nitrogen and fixing it into fertilizer and using quantum computing to bypass the catalysts that are currently being used, that's an interesting one. Trees on farm, could we plant more trees on farm and getting paid for it? The big one in my mind really is the measurement. If you can get this in, get people to agree on the amount of soil organic matter that sequesters carbon in the soil and actually measure it. Uh, the measurement of organic matter in the soil, I think, is very, very important. We still have not got agreement on that. Uh, technologies like my company, AgVisor Pro, that can put experts on the farm without having to drive on the farm, shrink time and space and reduce greenhouse gases. And remember that at the end of the day, we don't trade carbon, we trade data. So the, uh, the integrity of the data, and particularly as we uh, layer that on top of blockchain, and in Alberta, we've been blessed with a, with a registry for carbon credits so we can serialize our offsets, we can trade them, we can transact them, they can be audited. It provides proof for the large final emitters that are buying our offsets that they in fact are getting something legitimate. That's very, very important. One final piece of caution, when we're considering um, in the transaction of greenhouse gases and offsets, Permanence has to be taken into consideration. How permanent are the offsets that are being created? And lastly is contingent liability. If I have land and I've been paid for sequestering carbon and I sell that land to Mark, for example, um, is Mark obligated based on the practices that I put in and was paid for when I uh, was farming the land? So the good news is that there's lots of technology out there. I love. Um, the work being done uh, with Doff's greenhouse. Uh, um, I have farmers that I still work with right in that area. And if you're ever in that area, Gull Lake, right by Lincoln Hall, that will blow you away. So um, I think, uh, Mark, that'll wrap up kind of my overall thoughts. Uh, again, speaking off the cuff as it were, but I hope I, uh, I twigged on a couple of themes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Rob. What a great and uh, thought-provoking discussion. So, th you know, there are some questions coming into the Q&A already. I, I guess before 
I turn it over to that and start asking some questions. Just a reminder to the audience that um, we do have some time for a, a Q&A. We do have some time to explore some of these thoughts a little bit deeper. And uh, and so please uh, type your questions in and 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 vote for other questions that uh, that you'd like to see Rob address in the in the coming minutes. Now. For, for, forgive me. I, I've, so I've got a couple questions for you. I'm I'm a bit of a technology nerd, and you you talked about some really important things. You talked about biotech. You talked about precision agriculture. You talked about um, uh, quantification. You you talked about planting trees. Um, probably a couple other things that um, I'm are, are dodging my memory right now. If I had to ask you, maybe this is an unfair question, but I'm going to ask you anyway, if you had to sort of narrow down, what do you think are the top two or three innovations or technologies? So this can be a practice or a hard technology that come to your mind that we're going to need to advance the agriculture industry in Alberta to continue to be competitive on an ongoing basis. That's a very good question. Um, uh, globally, I'll just answer globally, without doubt in my mind, it's biotechnology. So uh, the ability of us to harness the power, a uh, bio series in Argentina is uh, working on grow, uh, uh, breeding, uh, using uh, genetic engineering to breed wheat crops that are more saline tolerant and more drought tolerant. That means you grow crops where you couldn't grow crops before. Uh, researchers have isolated uh, an heirloom uh, corn crop out of uh, Mexico that actually fixes nitrogen in the root exudates of the advantageous roots in the corn and are now trying to work on seeing if they can put that nitrogen fixation property from that old corn into commercial corn. So biotechnology by far, but you asked about an Alberta based solution. I think from a standpoint of agriculture to me, we need to get this NERP protocol, the nitrous, emission, nitrous oxide emission reduction protocol. Um, see, uh, we need to grow nitrogen. We need to utilize nitrogen to grow food. In fact, if you look at all the philosophical arguments around how we should grow food, I always say the detrimental or the Achilles heel is always an external source of nitrogen. For without an external source of nitrogen, uh, you, you, you cannot sustain half the planet on the earth today. That's a fact. So to me, nitrous oxide emission reduction protocols are very practical. It's about us identifying how much nitrogen the crop needs through the growing season. How much nitrogen is in the soil? So everybody should be, you know, we should be implementing a, a, a relatively high percentage of soil sampling in the agricultural ecosystem. We should be able to take and, and, and um, match up the target yield with the microclimate of the field where the farmer is growing. And then we should do everything we can to try to make sure the nitrogen in the soil is exhausted at the end of the year. If you have a lot of nitrogen in the soil in the fall time, it means that your programming wasn't very good. At the end of the year, you should grow the crop, the target yield should be achieved, and the nitrogen level in the soil should be very, very low. That's a really good scenario. So uh, I think that uh, farmers should be given credit for those things, soil testing, for accurate recommendations, uh, for utilizing nitrogen uh, stabilizers, be it urease inhibitors or um, um, uh, stabilizers of nitrogen so it doesn't blast off so quickly. And then also to make sure that nitrogen can be uh, put on through the growing season. If there are some incentives there, uh, I know um, my growers, we're, we're using now urea solution through the sprayer. So as we spray the crop, uh, two to three times, we're putting on about 10 pounds of nitrogen per spray. That means uh, 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen less in the soil where we don't control it as tightly as we would by spoon feeding it through the course of the growing season. Those are just some ideas off the top, Mark. Yeah, no, those are fantastic ideas. Thanks. Thanks very much. So one of the questions that's come in and, and actually I, I, I wanted to touch on this anyway, because uh, um, partly because it was it was mentioned in the closing remarks uh, from our panel discussion. So you, you'll probably know where I'm going here. One of these themes that comes up regularly is the need for collaboration. And so, uh, you know, maybe similarly to what I uh, what what we talked about with the panelists earlier, what what 
advice would you give to innovators looking to advance their technology and, and how can how can they get for example agricultural operators to take a chance as a first adopter of a new technology well you know i've got quite a bit of experience in the in the tech ecosystem in the province of alberta um, i'm a member of the a100 so there is a body of uh, technology entrepreneurs most of them know very little about agriculture the other side of the equation, Mark, is we have an oil and gas sector and we have entrepreneurs from oil and gas. They're literally sitting on billions of dollars and want to invest those dollars, but are uncomfortable in looking at agriculture. For some reason, agriculture is not seen as an investment, a place to put cash. Or maybe it's just really hard to find out how to put cash into agriculture. What I'd like to see is I'd like to see um, um, I would like to see, again, um, government step in to mitigate some of the risks associated with seed or angel investors. I would like to see uh, a concierge service, maybe Alberta Innovates could facilitate more of this, where there's a matching up of, of uh, agricultural starters, uh, startup companies, they're looking at some of these efficiencies and some of the carbon reduction things that could happen in agriculture and marry them up with the technology uh, ecosystem in the province. Because quite frankly, most people in agriculture don't know which way to turn when it comes to technology. And we find ourselves redoing the same stuff over and over again. So uh, I would like to see a concierge service that matches some of these innovative agricultural thinkers with the technology ecosystem in the province because quite frankly, we don't trade carbon, we trade data. So everybody's going to need a data system. I think the blockchain has a significant role to play in the serialization and the confidence in the uh, level of being able to transact uh, uh, options. And then the government, uh, I think, needs to have a, a greater role in mitigating the risk of, uh, of investors going in and backing these technologies. I, it's just, it's really hard to start a company in Alberta right now because that angel, that whole ecosystem in Saskatchewan today, if I was starting AgVisor Pro in Saskatchewan, any Saskatchewan investor that invested in AgVisor Pro uh, would get a 45% tax credit. That happens. It doesn't happen in Alberta. I know we got more programs coming, so I don't want to poop on the politicians. We got more pro, but we need to make it easy to marry agriculture to the tech's tech world. That's what I think we need to do. Perfect. Well, oh, thanks very much for that. Now, you mentioned a couple of things already. So I've, I've got another question about challenges. Now, you, you talked about a little bit about vilification of the industry. You, you talked about the investment climate, it, it maybe not not seen as a as a sexy investment or uh, or an attractive investment in, in, in some ways. Um, and so building on that, I guess my, my question is, what do you see as the biggest challenges? So we talked about some of the greatest technology opportunities. What do you see as some of the biggest challenges that the industry faces over the next 10, maybe 20 or 30 years? Well, I, I think it's the disconnection between the public and agriculture. I, I think I, I mentioned it. Uh, you know, I, I, you know uh, somehow uh, in the conversations I listened to over three days of the United Nations conference, somehow... Uh, North American agriculture is not being seen as sustainable. Uh, you know, I, and what, what is sustainability? Sustainability is if you have $100,000 in the bank mark and you live off the interest and don't touch the principal, that's sustainable. I can show you, I can show you example after example after example of farmers that I've been working with that have been farming 20 years and the organic matter has not changed or it's gone up slightly. To me, that's sustainable. And I think we need to, to understand that in the face of, uh, uh, um, of a nine, nine and a half, 10 billion population uh, on the planet, um, exporting nations like Canada are crucially important. And what I worry about, Mark, is the ripping away of tools away from agriculture. Two thirds of the agriculture land on the planet is suitable for the raising of grass, uh, cellulose and hemicellulose that ruminants turn into it's not never going to grow crops. 
it, it's, it's about livestock grazing and turning that into uh, meat for human beings. So we just eliminate all that? Is that the answer? Just to eliminate two thirds of, of the, the land that, that agriculture has because livestock are somehow bad? When you, again, to Karen's point, need to understand the life cycles and stuff going on. Um, I get concerned about that disconnect between the public and, uh, and, and, and the science in agriculture. The European Union right now the common agriculture policy in the European Union calls for 25% of all produce produced in the European Union to be produced by organic methods. Okay, fair enough. So 25% of the farmland in the European Union is going to be organic by, I think, 2030. The yield drag on that, conservatively, is 8 to 12%. Where is that production going to come from? As population is rising, where is that additional production going to come from? Brazil? one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. So how does this all square up? I don't know, but those are my concerns. It's a disconnect between uh, the urban uh, people who are remove, removed from agriculture and modern agricultural practices. I've said this before, farming is far beyond a red barn, farmers in bib overalls and a round fendered pickup truck. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. and. Um, you give me far too much credit for the state of my bank account. I think you put far too many zeros in front of the number that's actually in my current bank account. Um, this is this is really good. I'm going to keep going because uh, we've got some questions coming in. Uh, so the, the next one is, it's a little bit more about your personal journey in the industry, um, understanding you, you started um, very young. When you first entered into the agricultural space, looking back now, what, what would you say you were unprepared for and what do you wish now that you knew then? Oh, that's a great question. Well, um, what was I unprepared for? Well, I was unprepared for the, the trajectory of my career. Uh, if you would have told me growing up on the farm in Innisfree, Alberta, back in the day that, that uh, my career would be uh, as global and as big as it was, uh, you know, I, I would have, you know, I said, you're, you're full of it, but it, it's been an, you know, been, been a wonderful uh, journey. I, I think that I would have paid more attention to computers. Maybe. I, I mean, I got my first computer when I was 19, when I was 23 years old, but I never really learned how to code. I wish that I would know a little bit more about coding. But then again, I've been able to build some tech companies. So basically you surround yourself with brilliant people and, and uh, they connect the dots. Um, I, I think it's not just me, but I think I, agriculture on a whole as I look back over my career and see the tremendous advancements, like, I mean, we used to, we used to put on a herbicide and till the soil twice at four to six miles an hour, six inches deep before we even thought about planting canola. That was maximum tillage. And we don't do that anymore. You know, the advancement of biotechnology and agriculture has done more for the environment than anybody could ever imagine. It's not given enough credit. Um, I, I think that, I wish uh, I would know how and agriculture would know how to better bridge the gap between um, the, uh, the consumer, the urban consumer and, 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 and what goes on the farm today. I, I think that, you know, even this carbon discussion, so much of it uh, goes back to communication. So much of it goes back to communication. Livestock is absolutely being vilified, but again, people don't understand this. It's a, uh, it's not introducing any more carbon. In, like when you burn fossil fuels, you're you're bringing something that's been locked up for millions or billions of years, and you're pushing it in the atmosphere. That is that is new carbon. Um, what cows do is they recycle the carbon, and so and yet Hollywood is you know Hollywood is just. Uh, got agriculture in its sights. I don't think it's only Hollywood too. There's lots of sectors out there that are trying to deflect uh, their problems onto the backs of agriculture. Yeah, you know, thanks. And there's a, a couple recurring themes here. I, I mean, so if I could expand on that a little bit, if if you'll allow me to. Um, you know, you talked about the the vilification. You talked about sort of the 
the perhaps undeserved bad rap that the industry is getting. You talked a little bit about the, the, the disconnect in, in terms of the understanding. You talked about the importance of communications. Uh, are, there, are there any messages that, that you've seen that resonate that, you know, we can, we can go out and say, oh, you don't, you don't understand. You've, you've kind of got this all wrong, but uh, you know, I, in experiences from other industries, I've, I've seen that, that, ha that can have limited effect. Have you seen uh, internationally or nationally, are there any messages that, that tend to resonate with, uh, with the audiences that you talk to? When I when I get into uh, so if you sit down at a table and you have a pescatarian that's really something you have a paleo you have a vegan you have a, a, a meditarian and you have this thing going and you'll get into a big fight about the truth the light and the way who who is who has got the the right uh, you know the right way of eating or the the, the right uh, the right uh, philosophy. But if you put up your hands like this, what I've learned, Mark, is if you put up your hands and can say, you know, regardless of where we come from, can we agree that so long as we have people on the planet, agriculture needs to be infinitely sustainable? Can we agree on that? Everybody nods their head. And then what does sustainability mean? And I think by doing that, and, and I, have, I have a very abrasive, I can be a very abrasive person and I've learned my son has taught me dad you need to calm down and you need to have a conversation rather than preach because that's what you're talking about Mark facts don't change anything uh, but a conversation around what is uh, what is uh, sustainability what does soil health mean how would you increase water use efficiency what does greenhouse balance mean when you consider that in agriculture those factors are interesting because when you start to have a conversation around soil health and you acknowledge that tillage is destructive whether it's one-way disc plows whatever it is that, that you know there can be a moderate around a moderate amount of tillage but excessive tillage is destructive if we agree on that then we have to start thinking about ways that would reduce soil tillage would reduce degradation would reduce erosion and then you start to have some really interesting conversations like um, is tilling the soil three or four times or two or three times to take care of weeds is that better than a pop can of glyphosate over a football field i don't know like let's have a debate around that let from an environmental standpoint this is a real important conversation to actually have do we really want to have everybody tilling soil is that really the answer or how do we incent farmers uh, to move towards um, splitting nitrogen application using more um, slow release nitrogen, nitrification inhibitors, urease inhibitors? How do we make that happen? If there's an incentive there, um, eventually, you know, if, if there's a way to create a conversation around the way that we think that science should have farmers move and you create a bit of an incentive, a bit of a carrot, then I think this thing kind of moves along faster in the right direction. Yeah, great thoughts. So that's actually your, some of your discussion around soil health is a really good segue to the next question. So we're gonna kind of take a bit of a different approach and dive right into the weeds or even deeper than the weeds, uh, dive right into the soil. Um, there's, a, there's a good question here about the importance of soil sampling and the cost of soil sampling do you do you foresee or how do you foresee lower cost of soil sampling is that something that you've thought about something you've come across yeah there are there are a number of organizations out there that are playing uh with uh right now soil sampling is a pretty laborious process you go into the field and you would either do a composite sample or a zone sample or mul multiple zone samples in a field. Usually the probe goes into the ground. It's about a um, five eighths of a, a, an inch in diameter. The probe goes into the ground and you'd pull out cores, separate them at six, uh, zero to six, six to 12 and 12 to 24 inches and send them off to the lab. And the lab does a wet extraction, and brings it back. So there are a number of technologies out there right now. Spectroscopy would be an example of one I know of a company in uh, Quebec using playing with laser technology that will allow us to, and a company out of uh, uh, Chrysal uh, Labs right now, out of uh, 
I think Toronto. Uh, Crystal Labs just came on board with us as a partner with AgVisor Pro, and they have a probe that you put in the ground. Olds College is going to be playing with this uh, that would be able to give you nutrient uh, rec nutrient uh, numbers in real time uh, using their technology as a probe goes into the ground. Th those still are not highly scalable, Mark. And so what also interests me in the carbon file is if we could use remote sensing technology. And here I'm talking about a relatively high resolution satellite or aerial or drone. You mentioned drone, but I don't think drone scales for this. I think it has to be satellite or aerial. Um, and uh, measuring something called biovegetative index. So if we can measure the biovegetative index of various crops growing across 70 million acres and we can put a factor uh, from those biovegetative index measurements uh, back down to how much root mass there might be or to calculate how much um, uh, carbon would actually be moving from the atmosphere through this biovegetative mass into the soil that might give us some really big numbers to work with uh, quantitatively and allow us to scale. Long way from there yet. I think that's the holy grail, if we can agree. Uh, the other problem that we're having, Mark, is you put uh, four soil scientists in a room and ask them to define soil organic matter and the amount of carbon that's in that organic matter and how permanent it is, and you'll have a discussion that, uh, uh, that goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks. There, this is a difficult area that people are working in right now. So, um, but I, but I, I do think that we do need to have some scaling um, that has to happen in the industry. And, I, and I, I'm not seeing it just yet. It's still a very laborious process. Very important. It's a very important process too. Very important. Yeah, thanks very much. So uh, maybe um, it's an interesting question here, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about it. So it, it came in in the, in the Q&A, and it's around your thoughts on the potential for um, coppice willow or any other sort of short rotation uh, wood, woody biomass, for example. So coppice willow wood fiber production on, on marginal land. Now, the, the question actually adds some further context and talks about maybe it could be used as a feedstock for biochar um, and that could be used as a bulking agent in compost and, and it could have other benefits to, to reduce uh, wind erosion, for, for example. A any thoughts around short rotation coppice willow or, or other similar crops like that? Yeah, it's two, two decades ago, I ran into uh, large fields uh, uh, in uh, the Pacific Northwest that were plant, planted to trees. And uh, uh, it was being planted for an economic purpose. Uh, back then, carbon credit w wasn't part of the equation. In Australia, uh, there have been a couple of big uh, carbon funded projects for planting trees in Australia uh, for the uh, uh, sequestration of copper over the long term. I think this is, uh, I think this is something that, that uh, we can explore. Um, again, with the price of canola, uh, north of 16 bucks, uh, farmers are looking for every uh, inch of ground to, to grow crops on right now. It's going to be a good year. But I think that if society wants us to be leveraging uh, marginal uh, land uh, that could be utilized for uh, the for, for harvesting carbon. I think this is, is a valuable and, and, uh, and, and realistic way. You, you grow fast growing trees and then to your question that you asked Mark, what do we do with them? Well, again, biochar is an interesting, I've, I've run into three or four biochar companies recently that want to take and break down or to, to cook that and uh, utilize that for carbon, hydrocarbon remediation or things like that. So I, I think there's some option there for us. I, I like the idea of using uh, marginal, uh, really not that productive farmland for this purpose. Great. Yeah. Thanks very much for those thoughts. So we've got time for maybe one more question, then I'd love to get some closing thoughts from, from you as well. Uh, and, and this, this next question, I, I like it cause you, I mean, you touched on the importance of precision agriculture. The question, you know, is maybe specifically around 
how we can apply precision agriculture, automated data collection to gather meaningful data during grazing. But I guess, and, and so I'd love for you to to address that one. Um, but also, if you if you have any further thoughts around the importance and future of precision agriculture that you haven't mentioned already, I know you've touched on it. Um, I'd just love to hear some thoughts around precision agriculture and the role that'll play. Uh, and, and then we can uh, wrap up with some closing thoughts after that. Well, from a standpoint of how we use precision agriculture and grazing, there's been, uh, you know, you, you pick up um, on uh, people doing intensive grazing where they, uh, they basically divide up the uh, pasture land into wire fence zones and they really intensely graze and then they move and then they graze and they let that, that grass regenerate. So I, I think that there is more that we can learn about doing that uh, in agriculture. The other thing that, uh, that I like uh, surrounding precision agriculture, to me, precision agriculture is the, uh, the more precise application of crop inputs to maximize crop output. So there's, you know, whether it's uh, EM38 uh, electrical conductivity tools, or whether it's uh, zones from uh, satellite integration, I think there's a lot that can be done uh, at farm level uh, about appropriating the allocation of inputs, to, scarce inputs to produce a bigger crop in certain areas. I, I think that if, again, I um, precision ag is hard, we need a lot of systems integrators, Lakeline College, Olds College, Assiniboia College. These places are really important for kicking out uh, people who can make precision agriculture work. We need more young people in the industry. But to me, this goes hand in hand with the, the carbon file because the precision application of inputs to maximize crop outputs is really important. And, and I will say this again, uh, I think that some credit should be given to farmers for the carbon that is inside of the grain that's exported to China, Saudi Arabia, and all over the world. I mean, that is carbon that was trapped in that grain. The emissions come from those people that eat it, but um, they should be accountable for that. We've trapped the carbon. We, we, there should be, should be a discussion around that. How come we're not talking about that? Yeah, thanks very much, Rob. So uh, as we wrap up, I'm, I guess I'm curious, is there anything I didn't ask you about or anything, any last remarks that you didn't get a chance to make uh, that we can that we can close with? Well, I, 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 I'm a little frustrated right now with the uh, uh, the uh, the lack of traction uh, that uh, we've had with respect to recognizing no-till and minimum till and zero till in the country, uh, especially over the last number of years. And, and now, I guess, the, you know, the, the reason that it's not being recognized is it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a base practice. In other words, people are saying, well, everybody's doing it. Well, um, not everybody's doing it. There's agriculture all around the world that isn't doing it, and we are doing it. And I, I like to see us get recognized for what we are doing. With that all, with that being said, I'd like to leave with the glass half full. And uh, my perception of innovation coming from Canada is that we are uh, extremely innovative. And uh, people say we think outside the box. I don't agree with that. I think we have a really small box. And what I mean by that is that we have to put a crop in the ground in 30 days, we have to grow it in 90 to 110 days, and we have to take it off in 30 days. Those constraints create a really small box, and that really small box in agriculture in Canada causes us to be extremely innovative. There is a lot of good thinking that comes out of Canada. I would like to see the investment community harness its power, its resources to back uh, more of the entrepreneurs, more of the agriculture innovation from this country, because we could do a lot more. We already punch above our weight. We could do a lot more. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for your time today. And uh, thanks also to the audience for the insightful questions for, for Rob. Now, I do want to say before everyone leaves, we'd love to get a little bit of feedback on today's event. So as we close out, we just have two anonymous poll questions that should appear on your screen momentarily. If you could fill those out very quickly before you disconnect, we would be, we would be very grateful. 
Um, and as you're doing that, I just want to say thank you, everyone. A big thanks to our speakers and our panelists and everyone that took time out of their busy days to join us today. And, and Rob for taking time out of his vacation to, to be with us today. Very much appreciated. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we will be posting this webinar on our website. That's eralberta.ca. Thank you everyone once again, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Rob. Thanks everyone. Thank you.